My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the Welcome to War of the Rebellion. Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Meowser, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. And this is episode 22 of chapter 10, Retreat of the Confederate Army. Zuav skirmish drill, bayonet exercise, target firing. During the summer and fall previous, General Garrard had insisted upon the regiments of his brigade becoming perfect in the Zuav drill and bayonet exercise, and particularly in skirmish duties and target firing. So pleased was he with the efficiency attained by the regiments named that on his reports to General Halleck, he received permission from Washington to offer as a prize for skill in the bayonet exercise and skirmish drill the French Zouave uniform. The government, accordingly, ordered from Paris uniforms of that pattern for this brigade and complement, and as a reward for the high efficiency achieved by all the regiments composing it in the drill and tactic so much desired by General Garrard, every day in this camp, when the weather would permit, the regiment had been deployed as a whole in open order and vigorously drilled by Colonel Pearson in the bayonet exercise, resulting in the men becoming expert athletes in the use of muskets and bayonets. There was no prouder officer in the army than Colonel Pearson on the day when these Zouave uniforms were distributed as a prize to his regiment, and in the orders read on dress parade, Colonel Pearson congratulated the regiment and especially the officers, for their close attention to the new tactics and the skill attained by the companies in the same. The exchange to the Zouave uniform from the plain blue infantry uniform was enjoyed immensely by the men of the 155th Regiment, not only on account of their having earned the recognition, but also because of the great beauty of the uniform and the greater comfort and other advantages it possessed over the regulation uniform. The Zouave uniform may be described to those who have not seen pictures of it as being wide, very wide, dark blue knee breeches with material enough in one pair to make two pairs of ordinary pantaloons, and shaped not unlike the bloomer costume worn by some women years ago. Next came the jacket of the same heavy, dark blue material as the knee breeches and trimmed with yellow at the collar and the wrists and down the fronts. A feature of the uniform was the red flannel sash fully 10 feet long and about 10 inches wide. This sash was trimmed with yellow and was wound around the waist of the soldier, adding much to the comfort to the appearance and to the preservation of the health on marches and fatigue duties of the wearer. The footgear consisted of white canvas leggings, which came down over the shoes and were buckled along the sides and around the ankles reaching halfway to the knees, where the breeches were fitted into them. Lastly, the greatest and most impressive part of the uniform was the turban, after the Turkish plan. It was composed of a sash of white flannel about a foot wide and ten feet long, which would be nicely wound so as to set or fit on a red fez skullcap, to which was attached to a blue tassel. This turban was seldom worn except on dress parade or dress occasions. But the red fez cap with the tassel was always worn on fatigue or other duties. It took some time to get used to this metamorphosis, from the plain regulation uniform to the duddish colors and style of the zouave dress, and some most amusing contrasts were presented on the introduction of this exchanged attire. The French soldiers, whom this uniform was patterned and made, 
were, as a rule, much smaller in stature than the American soldier, and hence the imported zouave uniforms distributed in many cases were entirely too short for the many giants in stature in the 155th Regiment, and particularly in the companies where stalwart six-footers and over was the rule. For Sergeant D. Porter Marshall of Company K, being six feet nine inches in his stockings, had the greatest difficulty of any man in the regiment in securing a zouave outfit to conform to his stature. In contrast with Porter Marshall, the tallest man in the regiment, was Private Tobias Theat Rich of Company A, the shortest man in the command, who was awarded the longest pair of zouave trousers. There was no provision made in the army for a company or a regimental tailor to cut down and large alter, or mend uniforms. Colonel Pearson, commanding, met the situation which faced Sergeant Marshall, the regimental giant, by ordering the regimental quartermaster to issue two suits of zouave uniforms to the sergeant, one of which he could at least make one suit nearly large enough to fit him. After some time, the sergeant presented himself in the new zouave uniform, presenting a most singular and grotesque appearance on account of his stature and the novelty of the new uniform. While this uniform had its advantages on the march and was comfortable on other occasions, occasionally it was found to have its drawbacks. Thus, on the march, if its wearers straggled, the singularity of their uniform distinguished them from all other soldiers and aided in their detection. The ever-vigilant provost guards easily knew the camp locations of the stragglers and easily identified them by their peculiar uniform, whereas, had they been dressed in the ordinary regulation uniform, they would have escaped arrest. Mosby and his Gorillas The gorillas under Mosby disturbed the even tenor of camp life and in guarding of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad one night. Quite near the pickets of the 155th, they captured a mail carrier, Neil Bilton, and killed him. The guerrillas were pursued by guards of the regiment, who captured two of them in possession of the mail which they had stolen. During this winter camp life, many of the officers secured permission to have their wives visit the camp and share their headquarters. Among others who visited the camp and enjoyed the dress parades and reviews for a few days were Mrs. Pearson, the colonel's wife, and some lady friends. A few days, however, after these ladies left the regimental headquarters, Mosby's guerrillas executed one of their frequent midnight raids. The guerrillas, being dressed in Union uniform, went out and relieved the Union pickets, when, having secured charge of the picket line, they proceeded to raid the camp. They captured a brigadier general, two sutlers, and a number of horses. Had they known it, and extended their raid a mile farther, they might have captured General Sweetler and his good wife, who was at the time visiting the camp. An order was issued after these events, withdrawing the permits for officers' wives to visit their husbands' headquarters because of the attending risk and danger. Religious Services In this camp, the religious fervor resulting from the revivals which were inaugurated and maintained culminated in the erection by the regiment of a Union chapel for the Christian Commission and the regiment under the direction of the regimental chaplain, Rev. Dr. Mader. The men vied with each other in their zeal in constructing this chapel, which was soon finished because of the humber and material being so readily supplied over the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which the command was engaged in guarding. This chapel was duly opened and prayer meetings and Sunday exercises were regularly held in it for some weeks. The Reverend Constantine M. Egan, a Catholic priest of Washington, D.C., through the petition of officers and men of the United States Regulars serving in the Fifth Corps at General Griffin's request, was assigned to his headquarters. Father Egan had been given a commission at large to visit soldiers of his creed in the various camps being assigned to no particular regiment and serving without salary in the performance of his mission. Reverend Egan called upon Colonel Pearson commanding the 155th, who readily accorded him permission to hold services for the Catholic soldiers in the camp of the 155th Regiment. 
The announcement was read by Adjutant John H. Irwin at the usual dress parade. Reverend Dr. Mater, the regimental chaplain, also cordially welcomed Reverend Father Egan and tendered him the use of the regimental chapel to conduct services and preaching during his visit. Colonel Pearson issued orders that all members of Father Egan's denomination would be excused from guard or other duties from 10 to 2 o'clock on the day of the celebration of services by Father Egan in the camp chapel. As all the boys liked to be excused from guard, fatigue, and other duties in the camp for the purpose of seeking amusements and card playing, etc., in their quarters, and there being no orders how to test the faith of the soldiers deserving to be excused from duty, it was found that the entire regiment, or a large majority of them, had suddenly professed the Catholic faith in order to secure exemption from duty under pretense of attending divine service. Chaplain Agan's preaching was, therefore, well attended. He preached a plain, eloquent sermon from the Gospel of the Day, exhorting all in patriotic terms to serve their country faithfully in its hour of great peril. Father Egan remained several days in camp, the guest of Rev. Dr. Mater. It was an agreeable exhibition of Christian harmony to find these two ministers of different faiths working side by side, not only in the camp, but in the hospitals and on the actual battlefield, for the relief of the brave soldiers. Both of these exemplary ministers frequently endured sacrifices on marches and exposure in battle as much as did the rank and file. Coincident with this religious revival in the camp, it is to be regretted that the saving grace did not extend to some unregenerate individuals in the camp who made up for the shortage of furniture and their winter quarters by midnight visits to the regimental chapel, where they proceeded to lay their sacrilegious hands upon the nicely planed boards out of which the pulpit was made and felonously carrying off the same, as was later discovered, to their tents and secreting them under their beds and blankets until the excitement of the vandalism had passed. The pulpit furniture, sad to relate, was then metamorphosed into tables for cards, meals, and other profane purposes. The perpetrators were never discovered. Death of Captain Sackett and His Military Funeral January 24, 1864, towards midnight, the intelligence reached the camp of the 155th of the drowning of Captain Joseph B. Sackett, commanding Company E, who had in the afternoon in company with Quartermaster Sergeant John H. Ralston, left camp on horseback to visit the United States regulars. On returning to the camp of the 155th, about 9 p.m., Captain Sackett lost his life in crossing Kettle Run. A heavy rainstorm had come up while the captain and his companion were visiting the camp of the regulars, which had caused the stream suddenly to rise, so that in attempting, on their return to camp, to recross at the same ford, the captain's horse, in swimming, threw him off and kicked him, rendering him insensible and causing his drowning. Sergeant Ralston, on his horse, however, reached the opposite shore in safety, a detachment of soldiers from the regular camp recovered the captain's body soon after and sent word of the accident to First Lieutenant George M. Loglin of Company E in the camp of the 155th. Captain Sackett had been granted 15 days leave of absence at the time of the accident and intended to leave the next morning for Pittsburgh. General Garrard issued orders to pay Captain Sackett the honors of a military funeral from the camp of the regiment to the railroad station a mile distant. It was the first and only military funeral of an officer which the regiment had been called upon to witness or participate in during its service. While many officers of high rank and others had been slain in battle, the exigencies of the campaign did not permit of carrying out the regulations prescribed for military funerals, occurring at posts or in military camps as was the situation on the occasion of Captain Sackett's death. The entire brigade was massed for the solemn occasion of the funeral, all except the 91st Pennsylvania being attired in the new Zouave uniform. The command of the funeral column was assigned by General Garrard to Colonel D.T. Jenkins of the 146th New York Volunteers. 
the body of Captain Sackett, enclosed in a handsome coffin, was borne upon an artillery caisson. The thirty-two musicians, with their instruments composing the brass band of the United States regulars, headed the cortege, and in compliment to the companionship, a regiment of the United States regulars occupied a position in the funeral column. General Garrard and all his staff, with colors draped in mourning, participated in the procession. The sight was most impressive. The plain where the funeral procession was formed and paraded to the station afforded a fine view of the troops composing the funeral cortege. The solemn strains of a dirge, rendered by the band and the display of the entire brigade troops not on duty marching with arms reversed and colors draped, and the escort of the United States Regular Regiment presented a scene of grandeur and solemnity, and was a mark of honor and respect for Captain Sackett. Captain Sackett's command, Company E, was given the post of honor being next to the caisson carrying the remains in the procession. The remains were shipped to Pittsburgh, and there interred in the family lot in Allegheny Cemetery. Captain Sackett was an unusually handsome officer, having commanded Company E with credit in the three great battles of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. First Lieutenant George M. Loughlin succeeded Captain Sackett in command of Company E. Political Visitors to Camp During the state campaign for governor of Pennsylvania in 1863, the legislator having passed a law enabling soldiers of the state serving in the armies of the United States outside of the state to vote for state officers. Representatives of the state and of the political parties visited the camps in the Army of the Potomac to distribute tickets as well as to do some electioneering, both parties being represented in the visiting delegates. Among those of prominence from Allegheny County, who thus visited the army camps of western Pennsylvania soldiers, was a well-known divine, Reverend John Douglas D.D., a retired Presbyterian minister of Pittsburgh, who, in the political campaigns during the war, was quite active in addressing Republican meetings. On his army visit, it is related that a very humorous episode took place in the camp of the 62nd Pennsylvania, a great majority of whom were of the Democratic faith having enlisted with Colonel Sam W. Black and J. Bowman Sweetser, active leaders in the democracy, before enlisting in the service. Reverend Dr. Douglas was the guest of Colonel Sweetser, enjoying the hospitality of his headquarters, which latter often included the brave band of government commissary. During a discussion of the relative merits of the democracy and republicanism, and the generals of both parties in the field, a warm debate ensued between the mighty host and his clerical visitor, lasting until the wee small hours of the night. Both combatants pugnaciously and aggressively maintained their diametrically conflicting views. The contest became so personal that General Sweetser felt constrained to warn the doughty divine that, if it were not for his ministerial coat, he, Sweetser, would thrash the life out of him for his unpatriotic utterances and denunciation of McClellan, Porter, and other heroes of the war who were of the democratic faith, and under whom Sweetser had fought so many campaigns. The Reverend Dr. Douglas, with true Irish courage, accepted the challenge of Colonel Sweetser and declared that his ministerial cloak need be no bar to determining right then and there the supreme question of the moment as to which of the two was the better man. Douglas whirled off his coat and defied Sweetser. When the staff officer of the latter interfered and prevented the wordy combatants from coming to blows. In a day or two this incident was forgotten, and Colonel Sweetser and Dr. Douglas, ever after in Pittsburgh, where they long survived the close of the war, Continued the warmest of friends. Reviews, drills, amusements. February 11th, 1864, will long be remembered by reason of a brigade review, which was the first full dress Zouave review held in the Army of the Potomac. General Ayers, commanding the division, was the reviewing officer, and he expressed himself as well pleased congratulating the officers commanding the brigade. In this camp, 
The regiment had the usual outdoor exercises, games of ball, pitching horseshoes, boxing, for which many had sent home for gloves. Sparring and wrestling matches often took place. Fiddles that had been laid aside during the active campaigning were unearthed. Cotillions, round dances, and amusements generally were invoked. The members composing the regimental glee club of the previous winter's camp, however, were missed. Colonel E.J. Allen, himself a fine singer, Colonel John H. Kane, Adjutant E.A. Montooth, the leading performers in the concerts of the previous year, were absent, whilst George P. Fulton, John Ralston, John H. Irwin, Sergeant Harry Campbell, Sergeant Major Hodden Marshall, Corporal Robert R. Colt, and others survived, and gave the benefit of their music on the long winter evenings, yet the absence of the originators of the Glee Club was felt. Valentine's in Camp and from home. A great season in this camp, however, was St. Valentine's Day, February 14th. The Valentines sent and received by the boys added very much to the revenues of the postal department, judging by their numbers. The sutler was supplied with a highly colored assortment of humorous Valentines. Sheets so prominent in the windows at home were in stock, and the sutler had large sales of them in this camp. Not satisfied, however, with these highly colored pictures, many of the soldiers employed amateur artists and color painters to make drawings and sketches suitable for sweethearts at home. The favorite drawing, in the absence of tintypes and photographs, was the cartoon sketching of the soldier in the new Zouave uniform, which afforded a fine field for the amateur painters in camp, using Osborne's watercolors. These cartoons depicted the Zouave in the attitude of resisting a cavalry charge or bayoneting a fleeing confederate, etc. The Man with the Musket I knew him, I tell you, and also I knew, when he fell on the battle-swept ridge, that the poor battered body that lay there in blue was only a plank in the bridge, over which some should pass to a fame that shall shine while the high stars shall shine. Your hero is known by an echoing name, but the man of the musket is mine. Lieutenant General Grant in Command Early in March 1864, General Grant, who had been assigned to command the Army of the Potomac, passed the camp on the railroad, and, by many of the regiment, a mental note was made of the significance of this arrival so near the approach of spring, and the conclusion was reached by all that it meant business of actual campaigning. On March 27th, at dress parade, a notice was read by the adjutant of the 155th Regiment that the regiment had been transferred to the 1st Brigade of the 1st Division. Also, that the Corps Commander, General George Sykes, identified with the 5th Corps from its formation and commanding it at Gettysburg and up to the present time, had been transferred to the Western Army. Also that Major General Governor K. Warren had been promoted from Chief Engineer of the Army of the Potomac to succeed General Sykes as commander of the 5th Army Corps. General Sykes was a most efficient and faithful officer in every battle of the Army of the Potomac, having won his fame and reputation as a commander of the United States Regulars, that General Sykes reciprocated the love and esteem the Corps had for him is shown by his farewell address, which was read to all the regiments at Jess Parade, reading as follows. Headquarters 5th Army Corps, March 24th, 1864. General Orders No. 5. Soldiers of the 5th Corps, by direction of the War Department, I am relieved from duty the Army of the Potomac. In obeying an order so wholly unexpected, I part from you with the profoundest regret. We have been associated together since your organization as a corps. We have shared all the campaigns of this glorious army, and for months it has been my pride and distinction to be your chief. The history of your achievements 
add a luster to the history of your country and in the great battle of the war on the second of july eighteen sixty three your heroism and valor indisputably saved the day i part from you feeling assured that your manly virtues courage and patriotism will still be conspicuous in campaigns to come and the insignia borne upon your flags and worn upon your breasts will in the shock of battle always be found in the thick of your country's foes Signed, George Sykes, Major General. Last Days in Winter Quarters In camp at Warrington Junction, along the railroad, the regiment passed the four winter months a most pleasant and enjoyable rest. They had all learned from experience the life and duty of soldiers, and also the benefit of discipline, and hence but little complaint or grumbling such as had marked the dissatisfaction and discontent of soldiers in the early days of their enlistment, characterized this camp. The re-enlistments of the veteran regiments had been highly successful. Many recruits were sent to the decimated regiments of the Army of the Potomac, including the 155th, and the Army was brought to a high state of perfection, officers and men submitting to discipline, cheerfully and willingly undergoing the hardships incident to military life and looking forward to an early closing of the war in the approaching spring campaign. Lieutenant General Grant Issues Marching Orders May 1, 1864 Orders were issued by General U.S. Grant, commanding the armies of the United States with headquarters with the Army of the Potomac, to break camp and to pack up and take up the march once more to cross the Rappahannock River from Brandy Station, a distance of six miles thus bidding farewell forever to our winter quarters and pleasant associations incident thereto. A feature on the resumption of campaign life is proper to mention here. It is the coincidence that while changes in the general officers from the highest to the lowest were constantly in progress by reorganizations and resignations, etc., reorganizations of the various messes of the enlisted men and non-commissioned officers in the commands were also taking place. Soon after enlistment, the soldiers selected their messmates, a mess being composed of two or three, generally three. No detail or assignments of messes were made by officers or others. The selections were amicable, being governed largely by congeniality. This frequently led to changes from disagreements, and but few of the original messes remained together even among the survivors until the end of the war. Many messes of three were wholly extinguished by the casualties of war, though not always in one battle. Many other messes were broken up through sickness or disease, causing deaths or discharges. Many more messes of three would be by promotions requiring a separation. Still more messes would be disintegrated by the detailing of members of the mess for special duty, such as guard mount, orderlies, clerks, hospital nurses, or other positions. Therefore, on this day, the breaking of camp on the resumption of the march marked as many changes in the formation of messes of both officers and men relatively, as did the changes in the general army from Lieutenant General Grant down. May 3rd, Ayers Division, now consolidated to a brigade, after breaking up camp slowly marched to Brandy Station, remaining there until about one o'clock, when the march was resumed at a slow pace. The column was halted near Culpeper, having accomplished six miles. This halt was supposed to be for the night, and the troops spread their ponchos on the ground and lay down for a night's rest, expecting no interruption until morning, although knowing that the march was to be resumed. This night, in view of the resumption of the campaign, the already heavily laden knapsacks filled with trinkets accumulated in the four months of camp life were overhauled with a view of making the same lighter by disposing of all unnecessary articles. Many sat up late stripping their knapsacks of their contents for that purpose. Many more were in most earnest conjecture about the destination of the movement and the result of the same in anticipation of meeting the Confederate army south of the Rapidan. Before the first sleep was had, about eleven o'clock, the regimental bugle blew the familiar sound of pack up, pack up, 
no time was lost. It was a little past midnight before the column was in motion, and the 155th in its place in line. Daylight on May 4th, 1864, found the column at Germana Ford on the Rapidan. Ayr's brigade was in advance. Consequently, the 155th was among the first to cross immediately after Sheridan's cavalry, which had passed over at daylight, finding only a few Confederate pickets, who retreated without obstructing the way. Here as they marched by at the ford, the regiment had a good view of General Phil Sheridan and his staff, who were halted near the ford to allow the 5th Corps to take position to follow the cavalry, and also to see that his cavalry wagon trains promptly followed the infantry column. After crossing this ford with the corps, the regiment marched five miles, reaching the outskirts of the wilderness at the intersection of the Germana Plank Road and the Orange Court House Pike, where all the troops and the artillery seemed to camp. The spectacle on the plateau of several miles in extent selected for this night's camp for the army was the most remarkable, and one which those witnessing it can never forget. It was a beautiful spring afternoon when the halt took place. The troops had no fatiguing march and were fresh and well rested by their long idleness in winter quarters, there being no stragglers. The breaking up of the winter camp and the present outdoor life and the resumption of campaigning was most cheering and gratifying. Numerous fires were started, each mess prepared its meals leisurely, having abundance of rations, and, as stated, the troops were in magnificent spirits. The numerous brass bands of the United States regulars and others attached to the divisions in the Fifth Corps were present in this bivouac, and bringing out their instruments soon discovered inspiring music, adding very much to the animation of the occasion. The Calm That Preceded the Storm The Fifth Corps, which was thus camped on the edge of the wilderness, was 30,000 strong, and with the corps artillery and teams and wagons all parked adjacent in that open country, as stated, made it a most remarkable scene. The music of the bands continued until the last ray of the setting sun had disappeared below the western sky, and the shades of night had settled down upon the camp. Everything was indicative of peace, comfort, and good cheer, no hostile sound or report from the enemy, who had fallen back quietly from the ford and allowed Grant's columns to come unresisted to the wilderness, had yet been heard. All was quiet, and still in that dense underwood and jungle or ground known as the wilderness, except the song of the whipper poor will and the occasional screeching of an owl. Where was the enemy? Why did the Confederates allow the crossing of the river by Grant's columns without resistance? Their silence was ominous. Usually in war, the crossing of streams at the fords is resisted, and works and ramparts are erected by the enemy to prevent the crossing by their foes. Yet the Confederates offer no resistance and even abandon their defenses constructed at the ford. Undisturbed, Grant's army, thus halted and in bivouac at the usual sound of tattoo at ten o'clock, Lights went out and the troops retired and slept as soundly and peacefully as in any camp during their service. No enemy disturbed their slumbers, and but a few had premonitions or discussed the prospects of the next day or anticipated the terrible fighting in the wilderness. The Holocaust that closed the next day's fighting was in awful contrast to the already described peaceful surroundings of the troops on retiring this evening. The movements of that part of Grant's army as the troops packed up from their bivouacs and camps along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, where they had wintered, had been closely watched by the Confederate scouts and pickets, and more especially from the signal stations on Cedar and Pony Mountains in the vicinity of Brandy Station and Culpeper. General Lee, in his fortified camp and winter quarters at Mine Run and Orange Courthouse, was supplied with reliable information of every movement of the Army of the Potomac. No one knew this better than did General Meade, the commander who, upon consultation with Lieutenant General Grant, the new commander, directed General A. A. Humphreys, the able and efficient chief of staff of the Army of the Potomac, 
to prepare and submit a project for the opening campaign in the spring of 1864. General Humphreys, accordingly, prepared a project that was approved by General Grant and Meade. To prevent the enemy from discovering the real intention of the Union commanders in the campaign about to open, no attempt at first was made by the night marches or through woods to conceal the movements of the 2nd, 5th, 6th, and Ninth Army Corps, or of the cavalry. On the contrary, in broad daylight, these corps with the cavalry aggregating on the army rolls, at that date over 130,000 men, broke camp and by slow and easy marches, commencing on April 30th, advanced to the Rappahannock, laid their pontoons and continued their advance through the pickets of the enemy south of the Rappahannock, halting at Brandy Station a day or two, and extending their columns as far as Culpeper. This route was entirely in the opposite direction from where Lee's entire army was located, and threatened a march to Richmond away from the wilderness, or the subsequent movements of the Union Army into the wilderness on the Spotsylvania route. The miles of ammunition trains and many more miles of supply wagon trains and quartermaster trains, together with the long column of artillery composing the 100 or more batteries of the Army of the Potomac, not to mention the superb cavalry divisions of Generals Gregg, Merritt, and Custer, and their wagon trains, must have attracted in the week occupied in the change of base the serious attention of General Lee and his vigilant generals. This open display of the movement of the Army of the Potomac as facing Richmond, indicating to the enemy in advance southward and away from the old battlefields of the Wilderness and Chancellorsville after the movement had been started, was all suddenly changed. When nightfall came on the evening of the 3rd of May, the 2nd, 5th, and 6th, and the Cavalry Corps, in advance under Sheridan, were ordered in conformity with the plan of campaign to march to the Rapidan, and there to cross. Hancock's Corps at Eli's Ford, where the trains had delivered pontoons for bridges. The 5th and 6th Corps on pontoon bridges laid at Germana Ford. General Wilson's Cavalry Division led the advance of the columns across the Rapidan. Meeting with no resistance except the feeble fire of a few Confederate pickets occupying the fortified points at the fords mentioned. The Ninth Corps, 30,000 strong under General A. E. Burnside, followed the Fifth Corps under General Warren, and the Sixth Corps under General Sedgwick at Germana Ford. General Grant's movement to wilderness successful. The movement projected by General Humphreys for the various corps was carried out very successfully, being executed with precision and promptness. Every corps and column of troops, and the vast army trains occupying miles and miles of roads and parks of artillery, were found to be posted in proper positions without confusion or interference with each other, so that it was a subject of profound congratulation, indeed, to Generals Grant and Meade, that their first movement in the opening of the campaign of 1864 was a decided success. This fact had much to do with the splendid morale and spirits pervading the entire army under its new commander in the opening of the battle in the wilderness on May 5th. Neither General Grant nor General Meade was given to the issuing of vainglorious, bombastic orders, either before or after battles, as had so many previous commanders of the army, who had been unfortunate in issuing premature congratulations. General Humphreys, in his volume on the campaigns of Virginia, contradicts the assertion of General Badu in his Memoirs of General Grant that the plan of campaign involved battles in the wilderness. On the contrary, General Humphreys asserts that the plan or project which he was ordered to prepare, and which met with the approval of Grant and Meade, contemplated no such thought as an engagement or campaign in so unsuitable a place as the twenty miles of wilderness presented. Its many drawbacks, its so few and so narrow roads, all of which were familiar to General Meade and himself from previous campaigns, suggested its absolute unfitness for the maneuvering of large bodies of troops. Its impenetrable jungles and undergrowth of saplings made it impossible to handle a regiment much less divisions and corps intelligently, or to form alignments. 
Besides, it was wholly impractical, by reason of the absence of clearings, or roads for either artillery or cavalry movements. Chapter 11 The Battle of the Wilderness Which we will pick up next week, my friends. All right, everyone. Sorry about the background noise. I'm recording during the day, and it's nice out, so we've got lawn mowers and cars and airplanes, or just the norm annoyingly. Hopefully in a few months, my recordings will be a little bit quieter, because I'll be moving out into the country instead of being in the middle of a city. So I'm just going to have to stick with me for a little bit longer with the lawn mowers, I guess, especially with summer approaching. All right, let's talk about... Zouave uniforms. Pictures of those bad boys from the regimental history are going to be on my website. Check them out. They are seriously stylish. And there's actually quite a few pictures from this chapter, the end of this chapter, I should say, that are going to be up on my website. So head over to rebellionstories.com. Check them out. Uh, some of the photos are actually quite comical, too, especially for the shortest and tallest among those. If you've ever served and you've gotten uniform parts that don't fit, it could be rough sometimes. Also, I want to talk about if you've ever been to Gettysburg, the monument dedicated to the 155th on Little Round Top has a soldier in their Zouave uniform instead of the Union blue, but which is what they actually wore at the battle. But you can kind of see why they changed it, right? Even though they got the Zouave uniforms a little bit later, they really earned those. And they kind of wanted to show everyone, like, these uniforms were really a part of us. Mosby and his gorillas showing up in this history. Of course they do. Of course they show up next to the 155th. Of course they would. That's just who the 155th is, right? They are the center of the Civil War, it would appear. You know, when we talk about General, not General Mosby, when we talk about Mosby, there are two great quotes that he has that I wanted to bring up since he's going to inject himself into this story by being a brilliant commander. And here they are. The first one is, and I quote, I always understood that we went to war on account of the thing we quarreled with the North about. I never heard of any other cause of quarrel than slavery, unquote. Then later on, in 1902, he wrote, quote, In retrospect, slavery seems such a monstrous thing that some are now trying to prove that slavery was not the cause of the war, unquote. All right, so the 155th, experiencing a revival of religion, is kind of similar to the one that happened in the Confederate Army at this time period. Uh, I'm not too big on the Confederate side of it, but I do know that it did happen. The soldiers of the 155th self-excusing themselves by saying they were all Catholic on that day, so they wouldn't have to do any work, is pretty spot on for soldiers and quite hilarious. Then having the same pulpit furniture of that same chapel being stolen, probably by the very soldiers who were in the chapel to begin with, is I found quite amusing. Soldiers will always find a way to appropriate things that are not nailed down or guarded. All right, let's see what else I got here. Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about Captain Sackett drowning as an example of what happens in conflict at all times. Any general knows that the force he commands is always dwindling at all times through sickness accidental deaths, as we see here, Captain Sackett, and lastly, through battle. It takes its toll on non- and combat operations alike. Being in camp slows that down, but it doesn't stop it. And I know some math whizzes out there have already figured out how to model that for modern military commanders. However, moving past all that, next time you're having a drink, pour one out for Captain Sackett. Just a little bit, you know? Guy deserves it. The general and the priest getting almost to blows almost sounds like a comedic joke. All right. Moving on. Val Valentine's Day. 
This one I found really surprising. It is not treated the same, and maybe because it was about the time, but I know I never got any letters, and most people I knew didn't get any letters when we were gone during Valentine's Day. So it was nice to read about these guys getting their due, you know. And I will agree, U.S. Postal Service has got to make a ton of money off the military with just packages and letters and all sorts of stuff, even with the advent of email. Because there, there's nothing better than getting a care package. Nothing at all. If you get the time, maybe send a pair, a care package to uh, some, some boys stationed overseas. Because I promise you, they will appreciate it. All right. Also, General Grant assuming command of the armies. I'm going on active campaign. I don't know. If you want me to talk about that, I guess. We'd need a few weeks. There's been hundreds of books written about it. Probably thousands. But the fact that, I don't know, I felt like them trying to trick General Lee with a diversionary march and then move past the wilderness. Didn't General Hooker already do that and succeed? Like, I feel like once General Lee falls for a trick once, he's not going to fall for it twice. So, but I haven't read about his defensive plans on this side of what he was planning to do during this, uh, during this time of the conflict. So that's just from my own observation. I just wouldn't expect it to work a second time. All right. The army getting a single day of combined rest the day before a battle. I wish I had a drone for that, you know, fly over it, record the army of the Potomac and all of its glory of being a rested and well-equipped army. I know armies are for the purpose of fighting wars, but I really hate when they do fight them. All that manpower, material and training essentially gets wasted over time as it's supposed to. It's, it's its job, but it just hurts me. Maybe because I know personally how much effort goes into it, but and I know sometimes it's needed. Like in this case, the Union Army being liberators for millions of enslaved persons. Well, I don't know. Now I'm just rambling, I suppose. But anyway, the Battle of the Wilderness, we'll discuss it next week. I'm not going to go into it this episode. This episode is already silly long. So, with that, my friends, I will catch you next week. We will, we will get going right into the Battle of the Wilderness. I am recording this on a Tuesday. It's going to be released Saturday morning at 12.01 a.m. So, I'm going to be hiking with all of my Union Army gear this week for 30 miles over the next three days. And tonight, I have to make a lot of hardtack and some corn cakes and some other stuff that would be taken with me. All right. I'm signing out and getting out of here. I got a ton of work to do. All right, guys. Have a great one. Take care of yourselves this week and next and this weekend. And uh, of course, as always. They will find him and know him. Amongst the good and true When a robe of white is given for That faded coat of blue No more the bugle Calls the weary one Rest, noble spirit In thy grave alone They will find you and know you Amongst the good and true when a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. He cried, give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white
fate is given for, that fate it 